Air Herald flew there, uh, Air Crew to FLS in November August 1996. He has told me himself. So I need to elaborate on that. Uh, I now request uh, to present a booklet, Professor. And in fact, this lecture is being this lecture is being streamed to IITs and uh, Anna University in Madras. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I've already solved all, all your problems for you, and hopefully solved some problems elsewhere. Um, this is not the first time we've been to India, it's about the fifth time, uh, but we're having a good time. Okay, I'm going to talk about carbon, carbon in nano and in outer space. There will occasionally be these just to wake you up. All right? Actually, they're there to wake me up as well, but anyway. Um, but I'm going to tell you that I didn't always uh, want to be a scientist. I'm not sure I ever did, because when I was a kid at school, I actually wanted to be Superman. <laughs> and uh, I've got the proof, because this talk is about evidence. And here's the proof. Because <laughs> I, I drew this S on this piece of paper. Okay. The problem was flying. And of course, Superman has to fly. So I had to do something else. So I played tennis and uh, gymnastics, and at school, I acted in a play, Henry V. And I thought I'd show you this. I'm the handsome guy on the right, by the way, just in case you didn't know. But uh, I usually tell people, young people, about your age, that you must not become an actor. The guy in front, he became an actor, and he's now 5,000 years old, all right? In fact, Ian and I were in the same year, and he's a lot older than me. I tell you, acting really ages you. Okay, uh, this is Ian as uh, Magneto, and he would do well, very well on this course here, I'm sure. All right. Uh, but in fact, um, he uh, visited us a couple of years ago in Tallahassee, and he did a workshop just like this, really, with the young actors um, at Florida State. I also had Meccano, and I made things, um, and I thought I'd show you this. And what is useful about Meccano is that it's really the way that things are made. It's a small, you use nuts and bolts. This it, uh, has gears in it, the way that a car works. Um, and in fact, I thought I'd show you this advertisement. advertisement. Meccano, boys, and of course now we better add girls. Okay, a few in the audience here. Uh, no boy who follows the Meccano hobby can be a bad boy. Or no girl who follows the mechanic can be a bad girl, all right? So there you go. So I had this, and I worked with these, and, and made things, and put nuts and bolts together. And I think putting a nuts and bolts together is really quite an art form. It's very difficult to do it. And I still take a great amount of pleasure out of making sure that they go together, they're so tight it doesn't come apart, not so tight that you tear the thread. So it's a really an interesting skill. And I put things together with nuts and bolts, but when I came to become a chemist, I put things together with electrons and atoms, okay? And so it's basically the same thing, but on a larger scale. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, made, I made a lot of th things at school, but one thing I did was a lot of drawing. And uh, here are some of my drawings from that time. Uh, when I got to university, I started to do posters and brochures. This this poster was on the London Underground. Um, these are some of the things I did, and I was art editor for the university magazine. And I want to stress this, because I think part of the success I've had in science has actually been because I had other interests, and particularly in graphics, in a way that I'll mention a little bit later. Um, so some of these uh, the sort of things, this is my book on molecular rotation spectroscopy, and my first award was not for science, this is a national award, it was for this design, and it was for the Sunday Times book jacket competition, and I thought I should blow it up because I actually look like this. Now, it's hard to believe, isn't it? But I, you're young and beautiful, most of you now, but you're going to look old 
like me <coughs> one day. So enjoy your youth and beauty whilst you may, because it will not last, not very long, and certainly not long enough. Anyway, I still do a lot of graphics, and these are some of my logos. This is one of my favorite, there's a research, proto research institute, where the R is dropping something in a test tube. It's a chemistry materials research group. This is the ICR STEM. Um, this is one of my favorite logos for um, a workshop on buckyballs in Australia. Um, this is Association Française Tallahassee, where I've got the, the uh, French flag colors. I always like the logo to have an idea, okay? And make it sure, but not push the idea too much. I redesigned the Japanese flag. <laughs> they, they haven't paid me for this yet, but hopefully they will in, uh, in yen. Uh, I designed this flag, uh, sorry, this stamp for the UK. And here are some of the drawings that I did. Um, well, I'm not sure what that is, but we'll go on. And here, that's Margaret, who's in the front row here. Um, and uh, finally, as I said, this frog uh, only got me a good. And that was in <laughs> biology, so I decided not to do biology. Okay, I thought I should have got very good for that. So those are the sorts of things I did at school. And I think it's important to make sure that you really do broaden your interest. Don't just be one-dimensional. It's a very important aspect, as we shall see. The other thing that I did was photography. I had my own camera, and this is it. And I'm going to show you what you need to do to get a picture. of the process. I knew the camera inside out. I knew all about the optics. I knew all about the exposure times. I knew all about the film. I knew the chemistry that was involved. I did the chemistry. So in doing all that, it wasn't a waste of time. It was a major part of my education, okay? And I knew what was going on. And the question is, how many of you, well, you guys might know what's inside the mobile phone, but most people do not, okay? And that's an important aspect of this whole exercise. Okay, <coughs> so I got to university, and then I started my own research career, and I started in what's called rotational spectroscopy. And if a molecule rotates, then you can absorb fo microwave photons, and you can determine from the frequency of those what the structures are. And these are some of the molecules that we studied uh, at Sussex, and that was my first major research program. All these molecules were brand new molecules studied by microwave spectroscopy, absorption, and also to get the structures and get their dynamics. The interesting ones are those at the bottom, okay? And now it turned out that my colleague, David Walton, shown here, was a genius at stringing carbon atoms together. He can make a chain of 32 carbon atoms. Now, he did that by what's called a cap copper catalyzed oxidative coupling. You see the H2O in the center. With copper, the oxygen pulls out the hydrogens and puts the carbon atoms together. Okay? And that was the experiment that we did with an undergraduate student. And we made this molecule, HC5N. Okay? That was a linear carbon chain. That was around 1974-75. And that led to an experiment in radio astronomy <coughs> because a colleague of mine was doing some radio astronomy at Takeshi Oka in Canada. And he was using this telescope to detect rotations of molecules in space. So if you have a molecule on the other side of the galaxy rotating, if there's enough of them, you can detect their radio signals. And here's a 46 meter dish in Algonquin Park that we used. The receiver was in that little housing. And here's an example of what happens. The molecule rotates, gives out a photon. The frequency of that photon is very precise. And we can measure it. And if we measure the frequency in the laboratory, then we can determine that that molecule is out there in space. And we showed that whole set of molecules with five, seven, 
and nine carbon atoms were out in space. <coughs> and here is a picture taken when we were really elated when we detected the second of those, HC5N. And just to show you, I used to have hair. All right? Lorne, I'm not sure he, he ever had any hair. But I did, occasionally. Believe it or not. And some of you will lose yours. Okay. I'll get my own back at some point. Anyway, this is a picture. It got into the newspaper. We were all excited. And I thought I'd show you this. It said, the chemicals were discovered thanks to Canadian work in radio astrology. Wow. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's the first big discovery of astrology. I'll tell you about it. Okay. Anyway, so that ended up. And that was a very interesting discovery. And then it just turned out that an amazing star was discovered, IRC plus 10216. And here's Eric Becklin, a friend of mine, who was, a, I think, a student at the time, who discovered it. Now, let me show you what it is. There's the signal. That as, as this infrared telescope went across the star, the signal went off scale and then came back. It, and here's what Eric said, 10 times larger than any star. He had detected one of the most, the strongest infrared stars ever. Partly because it was very close, but it was amazingly strong. And it was a very interesting observation, okay? And here it is. This star is the sort of star that produces you, okay? Every carbon atom in your body was produced inside a star like this. That star blew up, and this star has blown off this material into outer space. What you're looking at is a is dust, carbonaceous dust, silicate dust, blown out into space, produced inside that star by a fusion process. So every atom in your body was produced in a star like this. This is mummy, believe it or not. This is where you came from. And you're lucky to be here. After all, there are a lot of you still out there. And I'm sure there's some of you would like to send back out there as well. Okay, so that's the situation. And that star <coughs> turned out to have our molecules in it, okay? So that was interesting to me because I wondered whether we could simulate the conditions in that star and see the molecules that we had produced. This star here has a, an outer shell about one light year across, and here you'll see it's C4H. In fact, that's the shell of HC4 molecule. Now, that was about 1980. About 1980, that star was detected, and these results were being discovered. And about 1984, I was visiting Rice University in Texas, and Rick Smalley had developed a brilliant technique in which he'd used a laser to vaporize a metal, okay, such as aluminium. All right? And I was looking at this as he was showing me what he was doing. I suggested he change <coughs> the aluminium for graphite and vaporize the graphite and try to produce a carbon chain, okay? Now, that's what we did. The idea was to simulate the conditions in this star. This was done with Jim Heath, Sean O'Brien, and Yu Ang Liu. These were the research students about your age working on this project. What we did was we vaporized the graphite and we looked at the mass spectrum of what was coming off. And we discovered a massive signal for a molecule with 60 carbon atoms. And this is my printer. Here I said C60 plus, question mark. Didn't know what it was. Just a massively strong signal. In fact, you see it's flat topped. When you see a flat top on the cell, you know it's gone off scale. It was so strong. I wrote C60 huge and C70 also. What have we done? Well, we vaporized graphite and produced some C60 molecules. Well, I've been to Expo, and this is where, what I was talking about at the beginning. Be open-minded, don't just focus on one thing. I was interested in art, graphics, and also architecture. I was interested in this, and in fact, I was thinking at one time to try and get a job with Buckminster Fuller. Anyway, this is the Expo 67 Montreal Dome, which if you look at it, is actually all hexagons, or appears to be so, okay? This looked like graphite. Somehow, graphite, somehow Buckminster Fuller had made it into a round dome. How had he done that? I also had a star dome. I'd made it for my children. Margaret had bought it for me some years before and made it. And I remembered that, uh, I, wasn't, I couldn't remember exactly what the structure had been so long before, but I remembered that it had 
not just hexagons, but it also had pentagons as well. And so we discussed it. I said, well, we've got, I made this thing, but it's got hexagons and pentagons. And that night, Rick Smalley put, took some paper, cut it all out, and he came in the next day and showed that, in fact, that structure was correct. That if you put 12 pentagons in this whole structure, it would actually close up, as it did. All right? That was a fantastic moment, because it was such a beautiful object. We somehow had vaporized graphite and made a bunch of uh, footballs. Incredible. I mean, how could that be? When we realized it was a soccer ball, we did realize it must be right. How could it be wrong? Uh, it was just an amazing moment. <coughs> now, the big breakthroughs come out of left field. They come out of the blue. They're totally unexpected. If you know what you're looking for and you find it, is that a big surprise? Not always. Sometimes it's a big breakthrough, but it's not always a surprise. You've not actually learned anything. But in this case, we learned something. And the biggest learnt thing we learned is that graphite, under circun certain circumstances, will close up into this beautiful structure. Nobody expected that, and certainly we didn't. And here, this is a f picture of the football team. Bob Curl in the middle, Sean O'Brien on the left, Jim Heath on the right, and Rick Smalley next to me. Okay, so that was the big breakthrough. Well, giant fullerenes. There's not just C60, but there are giant fullerenes, such as this one. Let's make a ball like this. I thought we'd build it. Now, this is an interesting point. The reason for doing this was actually to uh, have a sculpture. It wasn't science, all right? I just wanted a model in the lab. So we built it, and Ken Mackay made the first one, and then when he made the second one, there was a surprise here. It wasn't round. Can you see this? It's actually pretty flat between these three pentagons. We started to learn something. And we realized that but Mr. Fuller had done something rather odd. He'd made it into a round structure. How had he done that? Well, he'd done it by some clever maneuvering here, and I don't think it was done with a computer. I don't know how it was done. But if you look around this pentagon, you'll see that the hexagons are not symmetric. All right? So this was interesting. As it grows larger and larger, all the curvature is in the pentagons, and it's mainly flat from there to there. Now, the point about this, this was not a research project. This was just done for fun. But it came up with an interesting result. And then we looked at it further and simulated one inside the other, looked at what the electron microscope image would show, and we realized that we'd learned something. And that is, if you look at the, this structure here, this concentric shell, uh, it's an onion structure of graphite in which the layers are not perfectly round. In fact, they look like this. And here you'll see a fairly hexagonal structure. And here's a little lesson. You never know where, when it's science. This was an arts project, really. And this is one example of art sort of project coming up with a scientific discovery. So just watch out because it turns out that when you're totally unexpected, not even doing science, you come up with something, or not even doing a research project, you come up with something interesting. Well, that, uh, hmm, very strange, there you go, thought it was going to stop on me then. Then there's a whole load of fullerene chemistry now, maybe 10,000 papers. And C60 has become an iconic logo for nanotechnology. It's a beautiful object, okay? It's like a supermodel. It's very pretty, but doesn't do anything useful. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the fact that science is the only truly international sort of uh, culture. In fact, it's more than that. It's inter planetary, it's intergalactic. The chemistry and science on this planet will be the same as on any other planet. Okay? We know that. We can see the molecules on the other sides of the galaxy. We can see the molecules on the other sides of the universe. We can detect it. We can see that the chemistry throughout space is the same. So if there is another civilization on another planet that's developed chemistry, they will know what it is. 
doesn't matter what your, you believe, what country you're in, what you would like it to be, it's the way it is. And I like that. And I like the fact that the people that I work with come from, as you see here, Spain, Ireland, the UK, Syria, Holland, Taiwan, Mexico, and of course India as well. And that's a, the best thing about it. It's independent of what anybody thinks. <coughs> it's the way the universe is. Now I left uh, Sussex a few years ago <coughs> to go to Florida State. Oh. Very strange. I don't know what that, why that happened, but anyway, it did. Got out of it. And I thought I'd show you my new colleagues, okay? Um, and here they are, okay? And they're quite good at football. Of course, not our soccer. Um, and Florida State has a really big, they're really big in football. In fact, when the team plays, I think the whole town of Tallahassee doubles in size. 80,000 people turn up for a, for a match, okay? But in fact, this is the team. Um, this is Steve Aqua, came with me from the UK, Daryl Ventura, Archery Span, Prashant Jain is uh, from <coughs> India, as you can guess, and is now at Los Alamos. Uh, this is Nicola Cunio, who is a visitor, Paul Dunn, and this is Paul Dirac. How many of you have heard of Paul Dirac? Well, I should bloody well hope so, okay, uh, because uh, he is basically one of the one, two, or three great physicists of the 20th century, of any century. Um, anyway, he may, be, he may be a good physicist, but he doesn't come into the lab very often. He stays out, by, out there most of the time. <laughs> All right. If you don't know about Paul Dirac, look him up. Okay. Um, now, during this time, between 1985 and 1990, I was doing a lot of things. I was working with the Rice Group. The Rice Group were working independently. Our Sussex Group were working independently to try and prove that C60 was the structure we said it was. <clears throat> and I started to play around with molecular models, okay? Okay, just like this little girl. She's playing around, she's enjoying, she's in, totally engrossed in making a buckyball. And I was sort of engrossed in making some smaller ones. All right? It was just really enjoyable. It was just playing around with my hands, with a molecular model kit. And I made this one. And when I counted up, I was trying to make a cage with 32 carbon atoms. When I made this one and counted it up, it didn't have 32, it had 28 carbon atoms. And I realized that it was really rather special. Okay, that, and here it is. And it's special because it should take on four hydrogens and behave like carbon itself. Carbon forms four bonds to hydrogen. And it was a rather special structure. That should be rather like an sp3. And we had a very strong signal for C28. And that was about 1986, 87. And in fact, it turns out that all these could be small cages. And that was very exciting at the time. So I predicted that it would behave like a sort of super atom. And then Rick Smalley's group actually showed you could put uranium on the inside. And we have recently shown that you can put titanium. So you can put these on the inside, not just of C60, but of some smaller ones. And so there'll be a whole chemistry in the future of these small fullerenes. Now, nanotechnology is fairly misunderstood, but really I think it has several definitions. It's not just small things, okay? But one definition, which I think is good, and part of it, is atom by atom, molecule by molecule, assembly of a complex system. And for you, something you might think about is, will it be possible in the future to basically, by chemistry, create a computer? Okay? Who thinks it will be? Nobody. So you think, by chemistry, you can't produce a computer. Well, what the hell do you think this is? What do, how the hell do you think this was made? This was made by chemistry. So... It can be done. It has been done. And it's been done without anybody actually trying to make it. It's been made by evolution. So we should be able to do better than that, right? The blind watchmaker. So that's the future. We've not even started. We've not even thought about it, okay? 
Now, the other aspect of nanotechnology, which is not well understood, is shown by this little bit. My favorite molecule is not C60. My favorite molecule is this guy. Okay? Now, does it look like anything to anybody? <coughs> A dog. That's right. It's my dog. My dog's made of carbon, hydrogen, okay, blue, red nose. I'm a microwave spectroscopist, so I can look at this spectrum, and I can tell that the dog is shaking its head, okay, and looking at its tail. Not only that, there are doublings in that, which indicate that the hydrogens on the methyl group are internally rotating. It's got a red nose because it's been drinking a bit too much beer, Indian beer, uh, probably. And if you've been drinking too much beer, you know what the problem is. If you're a dog, you really do need a lamppost, okay? <laughs> That's what the dogs do in, uh, in Britain, anyway. Now, the reason for showing you this is to impress on you that molecules are flexible, all right? And it's the flexibility of molecules that allows us to be formed. It's the flexibility of the proteins in your body, the flexibility of the amino acids, put, change the amino acids, the variations in the structure that allows the flexibility of chemistry to produce something as complex as a human being. That flexibility has basically never been exploited by us, but it's been exploited by a biology. This is nanotechnology. This is a molecular machine. It's hemoglobin. Hemoglobin in your body is pulsing away, and it changes its shape for a particular reason. In your lungs, where there's plenty of oxygen, it picks up oxygen and hangs onto it. It then transports it in the blood to where there's not enough, and it can release it so that you can actually burn up the hydrocarbons in your body, and you can use that energy the second actor is the most amazing machine of all, for me, in the body. It's this one. And just look at it. Those are protons that are being attaching themselves to a protein wheel which has negative charges on it. The positive charges on there is neutralizing the negative charge, and the wheel is turning, just like an electric motor. Not driven on electrons, but driven on protons. Okay. It's inside your body. You have billions and trillions of these inside your body. And what are they doing? As it's turning, the protons are opening these cavities, and into it ADP is going, phosphate is going as well. They're put together, and ATP is being ejected. And ATP is the energy source for everything that goes on in your body. So you're being driven on electricity. Now, you're stuck today here, and you're thinking about electrons. You should be thinking about protons, because it's possible in the future. This is where the big breakthroughs <coughs> may be made in molecular electronics. In, a, in I, I, you know, what it, you're stuck with electrons. Life has done it in aqueous solutions. We have not even started to be able to do anything like that in aqueous solutions. Open your minds. Think about something else. Think about, can you work in with, instead of protons, can you, I don't know, work with, say, ammonium, ammonium ions? Don't just get stuck in what you've learned. Think about something else, because out of the blue, something big might turn up. Well, what, what little work we've done on this is that we've made a little shock absorber. And I think this epitomizes nanotechnology at the moment that we can make a molecule that does that, okay? Just like a spring, okay? Nowhere near an electric motor, nowhere near anything that's particularly useful at this stage, but this might be because we know that it absorbs energy, but we can now start to think of making uh, devices with, at the molecular size, okay? And that's a very exciting possibility. The other thing, well, this is work of Prashant Jain. I thought it's a really nice piece of work, uh, it looks very complicated if you're not in an organic chemist. Actually, it looks pretty complicated if you are in an organic chemist. But I'll simplify it a bit. And it's actually four zinc, uh, eight zinc atoms in a cubic arrangement surrounded by oxygen, okay? 
linked together by a formate group. So every zinc atom is, is bounded by this and linked together. And inside is a methyl ammonium ion. And the interesting thing about the methyl ammonium ion is when you look at the X-ray structure, there are four positions for the nitrogen. So there's something odd about it. And I'll show you what's odd about it. It turns out that it's dynamic, it's flexible. The nitrogen atom is jumping from one position to the other. Okay. So it's possible to actually orient that atom in the shell by an electric <coughs> field from the outside. So it's a possibility for storage devices at the molecular level, okay? Because the orientation is a possibility. We can't really do that yet, but this is the future where you are making storage devices at the molecular and the atomic level, okay? There's lots of things of this nature. All right, what's the big challenge? I'm not sure why that happens, but for some reason, okay. The big challenge is the following. Can we make carbon nanotubes all the same diameter perfectly, all the same length? The answer is no, we can't. But let's think of a piece, some pieces of paper, okay? Piece of paper, what strength has it? Very little. But let's wrap them up into tubes, into straws, paper straws. And now let's glue all these paper straws in a perfect hexagonal packing, okay, just like that. You will produce straws that you can stand on. Well, you can stand on them, but if you do this, you can stand on them and it won't collapse. Out of paper, you can make incredibly strong structures, even with a very weak glue, all right? That's what you can try it out. <coughs> See whether you can do it. All right? Intrinsically very strong. <coughs> Nanotubes already have the, the, the glue. They call Van der Waals forces. They stick together. All right? What is the challenge? The challenge is we need a bundle of 10 to the 15, a thousand million million. That will give you something about this, the diameter of an inch or a couple of centimeters. If you can do this, this material has something that no other material has. Let's say what the problem with materials is. The material problem is that a defect propagates through the material. Diamond is intrinsically strong, but you scratch, as a diamond cutter tells you, you make a mark on the surface and just tap it, and the defect just goes straight through and breaks. Here you have some problem. This, this stuff solves this problem, and I'll show you why. A defect in this tube will not propagate to the next tube. Trees have already discovered that, okay? That's why a tree is incredibly strong. It's very difficult to blow a tree off. So biology has already discovered this type of structure. We should be able to make this at the nanoscale. This is nanoscale technology. This material will be probably, I don't know, 50 times effectively stronger than steel and one-sixth the weight. You have airplanes so strong that they will glide if there's a problem with the engines. All right? it, it's, it's, it's theoretically possible. And it should be possible in the future to do this. And see, at the moment, we've only got, say, 20. This is, these are double wall tubes in a bundle and maybe a few microns long. We need them meters long. Okay? So those are the future possibilities. Plastic solar cells are some others. If we, can dis if we can solve the molecular computing problem, we should be able to put all that supercomputer into a wristwatch. Right? Now that happens to be a Calvin Klein wristwatch. And the interesting thing about it is that people are prepared to pay ten times what that watch is worth, just because it has CK on it. It's interesting. If you put HK, my initials, no one's prepared to pay anything for it. <laughs> it's the same watch. And I think that's a problem. I want you to think about that. Why is it that people are prepared to pay huge amounts of money for garbage? I mean, this isn't garbage, but basically people are paying huge amounts of money for things that really don't have any real value. Right? And I think that's distortion of the value of things to society is a, is a serious problem. Just because someone puts a particular name on it the same, it's the same as this, or a logo on it. And I think that distortion is one of the things responsible for the economic problems that we have today. 
you can buy a, a briefcase for a thousand dollars. Now, how can a briefcase cost a thousand dollars? Really? It just is a briefcase. You put something in it, you open it up. That's something worth thinking about. And I think it's a problem for you guys in the future. However, what do I want? There are three senses. Three senses. What are they? Common sense. Now, you might think common sense is useful. But it presents a problem. Because here, common sense tells me that the sun goes round the earth. Does anybody agree with me? Come on. Yes, right? Doesn't it? There in the morning, there in the evening. Yes? Common sense. It's uncommon sense that's required to tell us and to show us and to give the evidence that in fact the earth is turning on its axis. Right? That makes it seem if you, s you don't know that you're moving around, but you are moving around. Right? On the earth. All right. Now, how many of you know the evidence for this? None of you. Why, do, why did you believe? Why do you believe this? No, I'm asking you, why do you believe it? You don't know the evidence. So you've accepted it. <coughs> and this I want you to listen to. Because you've accepted that without knowing the evidence. Now, it turns out there's some guys, Copernicus, Galileo, and Giordano Bruno, who were very brave to make uh, to claim this. And Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake for this. So I want you to take something away from this. That don't accept anything without evidence. You have to be able to question and doubt. And you ought to make sure that these people who really are responsible for developing the scientific attitude really had trouble. And you are the benefactors of this. So you must ask yourself, what else you've accepted without checking the evidence? Okay? There are a lot of people on this planet who have accepted a load of bullshit mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned <coughs> without checking without asking themselves what the evidence is. They accept claims for which there is no evidence whatsoever because it makes them feel comfortable. Okay, think about it. All right? Because if this goes on, we're going to be in much worse trouble in the future than we are now, and we're in bad shape now. Now, scientists are different from all of us. We learn that we must not accept anything at all without very careful examination of the evidence. Question everything. Assess all claims on the basis of evidence, and it is taking mi millennia to overcome the power of dogma-based authority. It took uh, 359 years before the Vatican agreed that Galileo was right in 1992. They spent 13 years, a commission, to study this problem. All right. You've accepted it. But it took them 39 years to decide that they made a mistake. And it's interesting to consider how long it will take for other claims to be recognized as not correct. Think about what I'm talking about. The problem is nonsense is common now. And a load of it. Right, what is science? My definition. There are aspects of science. The first is a body of all evidence-based knowledge. That's what you're learning here, okay? Some of you are doing and actually creating new knowledge. There's the application of that knowledge, which is technology. And then the numerous ways in which knowledge was actually discovered, the scientific method. That's incredibly important. That's something that you who are doing research and PhDs here are developing. And it's not learned so much as absorbed osmotically from a, an environment in which research is being carried out. You go into a lab, there are colleagues who are doing research and the difficulty, the disappointment when something doesn't work, the elation when something does work, and the discovery, the moment of discovering something that no one has ever discovered before. That's an exciting aspect. But there's something more important. Before science became useful, 
And it only became, science is, is not common sense. Science is uncommon sense. <coughs> okay? People look further here. What was the obvious? Science is something else. You look deeper, you find out why things are happening. Are they actually <coughs> working this way? It had another name. It's called natural philosophy. And because it's so useful, people have forgotten that it's a fundamental breakthrough in thinking and attitude. All right? It's something, perhaps I would say, one of the most important things that we've discovered, that we need evidence for truth. All right? The most important aspect by far is that natural philosophy is the only philosophical construct we have devised to determine truth with any degree of reliability. I'm going to say it again. Natural philosophy is the only philosophical construct we have devised to determine truth with any degree of reliability. So we define it. <coughs> we just define it as the way in determining truth. Okay? Then it's no argument. Okay? And the ethical purpose of education is to teach you how you can decide what you're being told is true. Is it true that the earth is turning on its axis? Go and find out. It's on the web. Okay? Foucault's pendulum. Yeah. Who's heard of Foucault's pendulum? Nobody. That was a major breakthrough. People came and just were admired this thing. It's, it's running today in Paris. Thus, teaching of a skeptical evidence-based assessment of all claims, without exception, is fundamentally an intellectual <laughs> integrity issue. Without evidence, anything goes. Think about it. Okay, that's my definition. Right, here we go. Does anybody know what this about this? How many people know of this event? Okay. Who thinks it was a goal? Who thinks it wasn't a goal? All right. You think, but you don't know. It turns out there was evidence. It was a goal. The referee didn't have the evidence. He wasn't interested in the evidence. They're not interested in whether it's true or not. They just want to keep the game going. <coughs> That's the problem in this world today. Well, key person was Abelard. By doubting, we come to inquire. And by inquiry, we arrive at truth. Pierre Abelard in Sic et Non 1100. In this short, simple, but profound sentence, it lies a complete description of science. Of course, doubt and questioning are intrinsic threats to the power of those who depend on dogma for their authority. Such as me. I'm a teacher. So I tell you this. But you don't need to accept what I say. I have to back up what I claim with evidence. And if I can't back it up, don't accept it. All right? Don't accept anything. About 400 years later, Bacon essentially proposed the modern scientific method in his book Novum Organum. New instrument. Think of it. New instrument. It was new. This was a new concept, that to interpret nature, one should proceed through inductive reasoning. One should proceed from fact to axiom and then on to physical law. And that was the birth. These two people, during that period, for three or four hundred years, it was during this period that scholars realized that truth could only be reliably determined on the basis of evidence. This was a totally new concept. As prior to this, it has been assumed that truth was to be found by studying the Holy Scriptures. There are large numbers of people who claim that today. Okay. Now, I think you would agree with me that if this breakthrough had not been made, we would not have mobile phones. Because there's not a lot of, sort of details in the Bible on how to make a mobile phone. Or the Quran. Or the... Well, I forget what it is now. It's... Um, What's your famous book? Yes, yeah. the That's right. I don't. I didn't. I've looked at that one too. I couldn't find a, a blueprint for a mobile phone in there either. I must admit. This led to a conflict with religious leaders, which still continues today. But only where natural philosophy has triumphed 
And it hasn't triumphed that way. <coughs> how both democracy and science developed. Just look around the world, and you'll see that this statement is correct. I want you to think about it. Because at the moment, there's a massive struggle going on global warming, whether science is right. Well, the science, we don't know whether it's right. We know that it's questionable. Is it a global warming? I think so. I think we're on the edge of a precipice. But I don't know for sure. Um, anyway, what do I care? I'll be well out of here when the shit hits the fan. So I'll leave it to you guys. All right. That's the way that some of the politicians are thinking. So think about it. One of my favorite quotations, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Belief in myths allows the <coughs> comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. That's a great line. Let me read it again. Belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. It particularly applies to politicians, because politicians are either one right wing, left wing, whatever. They believe dogma. There's no proof of these things. These are attitudes. They are dogmatic sort of beliefs. So they follow it. They have the comfort of opinion from their dogma without the discomfort of thought. And that's a problem. Because we've got big problems today which need to be solved. And here's the guy who made that statement. It might be a surprise. Okay, so what about science? Is it good or bad? Okay. Oh, shouldn't be there. Sorry about that. I thought I got this one. That's the one I want. Well, let's see what I think is one of the most humanitarian contributions of chemistry. <coughs> there were no mobile phones at that time, so we have to go by this amazing etching of Rowlandson which gives you an idea of what it was like to have an, uh, an amputation without an anesthetic. I want you to look at that and just think of putting yourself in the same position if you have an injury. People died of the shock. Women had mastectomies without an anesthetic. It, there can be no more humanitarian contribution to society than the gift of anesthetics. Not only that, what about penicillin? How many of you have had penicillin? Antibiotics. I'm pretty sure that n half of you probably might not be alive without penicillin. Because your immediate family or some, part, some of your brothers, is, okay. It's a real miracle. No, you don't need to pray for this one. This is blood poisoning in 1942. A year earlier, this girl would have died. But she was saved. Three weeks later, it was cured by penicillin because penicillin became available for some civilians in 1942. And the problem is that bacteria are evolving with an immunity to penicillin and to antibiotics. We might be going back to this. And we need young people smart enough to solve these problems in the future. So that's it. Pros and cons of science. There are negative things. And you in this country know that only too well with Bhopal. All right? A terrible, terrible incident. There's no doubt about it. Big mistakes were made. Hopefully we'll be better at this and not make such big mistakes in the future. But I think we're still going to need science and chemistry in particular. I think... It's worth thinking that the worst disasters are those we bring on ourselves. The atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. We have wars. We use our technology to kill each other. Okay? Bhopal was terrible. But don't take your eyes off the sight that we still have wars going on and our politicians don't solve our problems without sending young people like you to go and kill each other. That's what you're facing at the present time. And I generally think that most people agree, okay, Bhopal was bad, thalidomide was bad, okay, nerve gases. But by and large, I think most people would agree that we're better off today through chemistry, physics, engineering than we were at the beginning of the century. Those were mistakes. Some of them could have been uh, sort of uh, avoided, and hopefully in the future we'll be better at these. 
But look at this. If we didn't have chemistry, they'd all go. And physicists can say the same. Scientists work together to solve big problems, look after the environment, improve world health, uh, understand how things work, and hopefully enjoy making things. Okay. So that's the issue. And as I say, you can make those contributions too. So I've been involved in education. I'm here mainly for that reason, to wake people up and to get people to enjoy science and look upon science as something worth it. Okay. And here are some people who really like science and mathematics. Okay. I'm not sure that, that this is correct, by the way. I think there may be a negative sign, minus sign, missing there. All right. uh, anyway, Maxwell's equation, okay, DNA, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, LSD, so I'll cover that one. My favorite is this one, Nicole, physics graduate student, says, my tattoo is the Taylor expansion of sign. I consider it the most beautiful thing I have ever learned. Now, how many of you know the Taylor expansion, yes? Yeah. But just imagine, here's a young woman uh, from Stanford, great young scientist, who says, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever learned. That shows something, an appreciation of the language of science, because mathematics is the language of science. You can't do it without mathematics. It's not possible. Not only that, you, not only can you not do it, but you can't really appreciate it. So I can't appreciate your writers because I can't read Hindi or Gujarati. I will never be able to really appreciate the spirit. It's unfortunate, because I'd like to do it, but there are so many I can't do. But you have something else. You have mathematics. So you can see the, the neatness of the way things are and can see deeply into the sciences in a way that many people can't. The other problem is that most people really don't understand who scientists are. Most people think this is the guy who developed the theory of relativity. And in fact, they'd be wrong. He's actually an imposter. The theory of relativity was not sort of developed by this guy. It was developed by this guy. It's young Einstein. All right. You might be surprised to learn that he was 13 when he first thought, started to think about what it was like to travel at the velocity of light. He was younger than all of you. He was actually 17 when he was starting to write about it. And the point that I want to make is that it's you who are the scientists. You are developing now the basis. Okay? Einstein was a young man. Darwin wasn't, that wasn't the guy who actually created this book. The guy that did it was young Charlie, 24 years old. It was, 50, it was 25 years later when he was 50 that he actually got it published. He had already started to work on it when he was between 24 and 30. Clark Maxwell. These equations I hope you all know, right? <laughs> these are Maxwell's equations. Every time you use your mobile phone, you prove that these equations are correct. Thousands of times, every time. And if it doesn't, if your phone doesn't work, it's not because of Maxwell. It's because you didn't sort of charge up the battery. All right? That was something else went wrong. This is what he was. We Jamie with a little quiff on the top of his head. He was a young man. Fantastic. Have a look at his books. He was an amazing mathematician. Rosalind Franklin, she took the most important <coughs> photograph of all time. And this is it, which led to the structure of DNA. The implications of this structure are gigantic. They will be massive problems for society, because society and human beings are too stupid to use technology well. And this is an amazing breakthrough. And I worry about it because I don't think that human beings have the intelligence to use this information wisely. And I don't know if there is a way of using it wisely. Chandra Seker was a young man when he went to Cambridge and said that a star one and a half times the size of the sun would collapse into a neutron star. And he wasn't believed. 
he was too far ahead of his time. Eddington, a very eminent scientist, poo-pooed this idea. And Chandrasekhar, who would otherwise have been at Cambridge, went off to Chicago for the rest of his life. Jim Heath, Sean O'Brien, Yuan Liu, and John Hare were the young students who worked on our project, okay, who have now got wonderful careers of their own. Okay, so I decided to work on the internet, and we've made 300 programs, 70 shown on the BBC. And your world is incredibly different from mine. When I, well, it's the same now, but not when I was your age. How many of you looked at an encyclopedia this week? Yeah. All right. How can you find the information in there? Okay. You've got to, I can't even lift the book. <coughs> I've got to get, to, 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 they're too heavy. Okay, what you have now is the Guyu Wiki world, okay? All right, G-Y-W-W. It's a fantastic world. Let's look at this image. This is an image in Encyclopedia Britannica. I've got to take the book, open it up, find the page. If I put this into the Google image browser, okay? In seconds, I will get pages and pages and pages. I think there are about 90 pages of images of some 60. Okay. And it goes on forever, and even rotating ones. <laughs> so your world is revolving, a revolution. Right? It's a fantastic revolution. It's a triple revolution. Finding material instantaneously, creating it easily. Hollywood <coughs> and Bollywood. Okay, and the TV <coughs> companies are no longer in charge of who is making films. Wikipedia, fantastic. People are altruistically giving you information which you can ask, access immediately. Some of it is better than the textbooks. In my field, it's better than the textbooks. There are more mistakes in the textbooks than there are in Wikipedia in my field of spectroscopy. And we're building a global cache of URL links. We're creating uh, this by recording. Okay. So what are we doing? Well, it's called Geoset. <coughs> we use capture station technology. Um, this is, uh, I don't need to come here. In fact, I'm going by internet or by Skype. But in fact, I'm streaming material from my site at the present moment and the PowerPoint. So I don't need to come here. I could do it by internet. And it's the future of broadcasting as far as I'm concerned. All right. Well, I don't have time to show you all these, but we've got recordings by young people. Well, let me show you one. I'll show you a, a graduate student, okay? <coughs> Hi, my name is Kerry Gilmore, and I am a graduate student here at Florida State University. I work for Dr. Al Bugan as the organic chemist. Now, I love organic chemistry because it provides the opportunity to go through and be an architect, an engineer, a builder, to go through and really look at designing molecules, we can figure out how to actually make these molecules, and then finally, we actually get to go into lab and actually build these things. Now, the greatest organic chemist by far is nature. Nature can go through and take something as utterly simplistic as these small jump seeds, i.e. we actually want to do this type of chemistry. Well, these structures that you see now on the left-hand side are used as what's called uh, molecular wires or nanowires. And these are very, very good at going through and conducting electricity, conducting heat. And we can use them to form much smaller, for example, circuit boards for computers, for cameras, for video games, to make things a lot faster and a lot. Uh, Let me stop it there. We're now recording our graduate students, our postdocs, and our undergraduates. And it turns out they're getting jobs because we now use these recordings for their resumes and their CVs. Instead of being a pile of paper here, which I've got to read all that through, right? This is what you would like me to know, if, if that's who you are. But in fact, what I'm doing now is I look by an assessment. I've got a pile of paper like this. I know I, it's, it's a headache. I can watch this on my laptop and can see you making a presentation. So, for instance, I get a request from India every week for someone who wants a postdoc with me. I get a, a CV, I have to print it out. I have to read it out. Now, if he sends me a URL, and it's like Kerry, 
there, and I can see the project, and I can see the PowerPoint, which we ne now can do, and which our students are doing, then we're in business, and our students are getting jobs. All right? Let's just show you. Kerry got a Fulbright, and he's now got, uh, he's had um, <coughs> offers at Caltech, and I think MIT. And the URL of his presentation was crucial. Steve worked on our, I haven't been able to show it, but we got a rich media award. Prashner is actually from Kolkata. And she got four tenure track awards. She got her postdoc in Santa Barbara for just the first postdoc she wanted. And she's just been put in charge <coughs> of a major outreach project because of the presentation she made on our website. Brittany got into medical school. Jeff said he thinks it helps. He got a job. Our trees went and they'd already read it. She'd already got the interview. Before she went to the interview, she was almost accepted. You haven't seen the others, but they're all doing <coughs> fantastically well. So it works. <coughs> the G-Force, the people helping me, I thought I'd show you Colin, Steve, Sam, and Penny. And in fact, the other person helping me is here in the audience. And the reason I'm here is because Margaret wanted to come to India. I wanted to sit and have a glass of wine. I said, um, I got it last night. Thank you very much for the, for the glass of wine. <laughs> All right. Um, now, however, what I want to do is finish off. Whoop. It's a bit touchy, this thing. Because out of, out of space. The third man. Diamond and graphite and C60. Okay. Now, it turns out there's a film called The Third Man. The Third Man is a very famous film. And Orson Welles, The Third Man, um, he's hiding in the back streets and in the sewers of Vienna just after the war. And people thought he was around, but they couldn't prove it, and this, that, and the other. Someone saw, I think they saw him, The Third Man was seen at a particular event. And, and uh, I always thought of C60 as his diamond and graphite as the third man, lurking around, hiding away. It took till the end of the 20th century to find out this third form of carbon. And I thought it would be in the galaxy as well. And I thought I'd show you a little bit of the film. stop it there because you can watch it on YouTube. Okay. Now, as I said, I always thought of C60 as being the third man. And I thought it would be lurking in the galaxy somewhere and be very difficult to detect. But it turns out, amazingly, last year, the Spitzer telescope, which is an infrared telescope in space, discovered it. This is the infrared vibrational signal of an object in space. And see all these peaks here? And this is the infrared signal of C60, the red. And this is the infrared signal of C70. All the peaks are there. 
It's incredible. And this is a big surprise. Because coming out of the star, a carbon star, where all carbon atoms are made, the sort of star where your carbon atoms were made, C60 is to be found. So it just seems that once upon a time, you were all bits of C60. Isn't that incredible? Unfortunately, you're not quite as pretty as C60. <laughs> well, not, not, well, the girls are, the, 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 the blokes aren't, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, the thing is that we made a film. The BBC made a film in 1992. <coughs> and this is the end of it. And this is Wolfgang Kretschmer. And this guy, with his colleague Don Huffman and Lowell Lamb, and Costas Foster Office did a massive breakthrough because they extracted C60. <coughs> Unfortunately, we were about a week or two too late. But this was a great piece of science. But I thought I'd show you this. Oh, oh come on. Very touchy today. I'm not sure why, but I'll do it from here. <laughs> I believe it is there. And it would be rather nice to feel that, in fact, we were on the right track. There are some interesting features in space, and C60 certainly can fit them better than any other proposal that has been made up to now. I'm a believer, and I think ultimately we'll find that it is there. But others have said that uh, C60 is nothing like a match for the diffuse interstellar band. They're wrong. Thanks a lot. You're in charge.